Motorcycles with two-stroke engines have long been considered dirty, noisy, smelly, smoky, and a cheap alternative to a four-stroke. What follows is a brief look at which big two-stroke road bikes are regarded as the most impressive ones ever produced. I bet you never thought that I could type that fast. In 1969, Kawasaki introduced their H1 Mark III. It had a 500cc inline three-cylinder two-stroke engine, and it was nothing short of a rocket ship on two wheels. This bike was the original Widowmaker. It pumped out 60 horsepower, and for a very short time, it was the most powerful production road bike in the world. Regrettably, I should have at least mentioned it in the channel's doco, The First Superbike. So, I do sincerely apologise to any Quacker Triple fans out there about that. But in my defence, it was only a few months after the H1 was released that Honda eclipsed it with their CB750. However, the H1 was over 40 kilos lighter, and comparing performance figures between the two, there was really nothing in it. The Mark III had a top speed of approximately 120 miles per hour, and it covered the quarter mile in about 13 seconds. Kawasaki claimed better, of course, as they all do, but in period road tests, the H1 was still substantially quicker accelerating than the Honda CB750, although its top speed was slightly less. The H1's frame flexed quite a bit, resulting in tank slappers, and the pretty ordinary tyres available at that time weren't really up to handling its huge amount of power which came on all of a sudden once you hit the power band, resulting in many unintentional wheelies. All these factors combined earned a bike a bad reputation for being dangerous, hence the nickname, the Widowmaker. But the H1 was still a fantastic motorcycle. It spawned a whole new generation of high-performance two-stroke triples for Kawasaki including a 250, 350, 400, and of course, the infamous Kawasaki H2 750. This bike produced 74 horsepower, and combined this with the fact it didn't even weigh 200 kilos, gave the bike a claimed quarter mile time of 12 seconds, and a claimed top speed of 125 miles per hour. Although, in period road tests, they rarely achieved these figures. History tells many stories about extreme power delivery and poor handling, which of course are all true to some degree, but the H2's engine had a much broader and flatter power curve compared to the H1, which made it a much better overall motorcycle, albeit extremely thirsty on fuel. It only averaged around 25 miles per gallon. My mate had one of the later models which he bought new, and of course, like so many others, he ended up crashing it. Nowadays, they are a true collector's bike, and prices for them have risen substantially in recent years. Similar to Kawasaki, another Japanese company also introduced a range of three-cylinder two-strokes in the early 1970s. The Suzuki GT380, GT550, and their water-cooled GT750. All three of the Suzukis were much more civilised than the Kawasaki triples, because their engines weren't as peaky, but they were heavier. I owned a GT550 myself, which was fitted with expansion chambers. In standard trim, the original 550 produced 50 horsepower. Later models had 53, and the bike had a top speed of 110 miles an hour, if you're lucky. Unfortunately, back in those days, there was no such thing as rider training. So like many others, I learnt to ride bikes on the road the hard way, and I crashed my 550 more than once. 
For a very short period, I also owned a GT750. But I remember always preferring the 550, as it was a much lighter and a much more nimble machine. Like most bikes in the early 1970s, when they first came out, they all had drum brakes front and rear, with later models of course having disc brakes up front. Suzuki's GT750 was marketed more as a Tora, and when first released they had 67 horsepower. Later models had 70. While the 750 was only about 10 miles an hour faster than the 550, it certainly reached its top speed a lot quicker, with quarter mile times around the 13 second mark, or even less, about one second quicker than the 550. The bike earned many nicknames, the water buffalo, the water bottle, and the kettle, all because of its water-cooled engine, which was something new in the 1970s. Or was it? Some riders believe that the Japanese pioneered two-stroke motorcycles. But the truth is that Alfred Scott from Great Britain and founder of Scott Motorcycles introduced the first two-stroke motorcycle to the public in the year 1908. It was a 450cc twin, which, you guessed it, was water cool. In 1936, Scott introduced its Model 3S, a 986cc water-cooled two-stroke. Yes, there was actually one 1,000cc two-stroke motorcycle manufactured. It was an inline triple which produced 48 horsepower. That was quite a lot of power back in those days. And its top speed was a shade under the magic ton. Missed it by that much. <laughs> Its very exquisitely designed and huge two-stroke engine boasted a number of technical innovations, far too many to go into in this video. Another feature that was later copied by Honda on their gold wings was that the fuel tank was actually a dummy. The first ones built featured a hinged and lubed car type bonnet with a fuel tank beneath it, while on later versions it housed the instrumentation and the fuel was actually contained in what looked like twin toolboxes on each side of the rear wheel. It was an extremely advanced motorcycle for its time, but it was unbelievably expensive, hence sales were poor. Only very few were produced before the outbreak of the Second World War, and sadly, they never restarted production of this extremely exceptional motorcycle after the war. But Scott's best and most famous bike was a Flying Squirrel albeit a very odd choice for a name. It was first introduced in 1926. It was a 600cc water-cooled parallel twin two-stroke, and it had 28 horsepower. And these first bikes were capable of a top speed of 75 miles per hour. They used rotary valves to control induction, something riders of Japanese bikes, 40 years later in the 1960s and 1970s, were led to believe was the latest thing. They were a popular choice for sidecars, but production ceased during World War II and did not resume until after the war. Just a few years later, in 1950, the company ran into financial trouble and they stopped production again. They were revived again in the late 1950s and updated with new rear suspension, twin front brakes and telescopic forks. By the late 1960s, the effort to revive the Scott brand faded away again. Enter George Silk. And in 1975, the all-new Silk 700S was introduced. It featured a newly designed Scott two-stroke engine. And by all reports, these new Silks handled quite well. And they had a top speed of 115 miles per hour. The Mark II, or Silk Sabre, introduced in 1977, had even more upgrades and it produced 48 horsepower. 
But by 1979, only very few had been produced before the company folded yet again. The Scott Motorcycle is truly an iconic motorcycle brand, and today they are very rare and a much sought after machine. Just before the Second World War started, CZ, a Czechoslovakian manufacturer, released their 500cc two-stroke twin. The original versions were black, it only produced 15 horsepower, and with a top speed of just 70 miles per hour, it was hardly a groundbreaking motorcycle, I know. But, believe it or not, the Vatican commissioned CZ to produce 14 special versions. These bikes were produced for the Papal Guards to escort the Pope around Rome. They were creamy white with white wall tyres. The seat was covered with white leather and many of the bike's parts were gilded with 24 karat gold. But unless the Papal Guards had special riding clothes, I imagine that they would have looked quite strange riding them. To me, the bike looks more like something that Elvis Presley would have ridden. What do you think? Almost half a century later in the mid-1980s, Yamaha and Suzuki released a couple of near-race replica motorcycles. Both of them were 500cc two-strokes of unbelievable power and performance. The Yamaha RZ500, or RD500LC in some countries, was a liquid-cooled V4 which produced a huge 88 horsepower. While the Suzuki RG500 employed a liquid-cooled Square 4 engine, and it produced even more power, a massive 95 horsepower. Both bikes, however, had a similar top speed, which approached 150 miles per hour. But the Suzuki, being more powerful and lighter, was the quicker of the two, completing the quarter mile in the low 11 second bracket. The biggest motorcycle manufacturer in the 1920s was DKW. Their Super Sport 600 introduced in 1930, was DKW's ultimate road bike. It was its heaviest and most powerful road-going machine that they manufactured. Its 600cc water-cooled two-stroke parallel twin produced 22 horsepower, and the bike had a top speed of 80 miles per hour. At that time in Germany, these bikes were called the Horsch of motorcycles. Horsches were a high-class luxury German car at that time. And similar to the Flying Squirrel, the Super Sport 600 was also a popular choice for sidecar use. Not to mention a very nice motorcycle to look at. Like Scott, DKW's specialty was two strokes, and by the late 1930s, their supercharged 250cc race bikes produced 45 horsepower, which was a remarkable amount of power for that period, especially for a 250. Approaching the end of this video, I know what some of you are thinking. I've missed a bike, right? But no, I haven't. We all have our favourite bikes, right? So, I've saved my own personal favourite for absolute last. While it may not have been the most powerful, quickest accelerating, or the fastest two-stroke of the period, you could ride the Suzuki T500, or Titan, to the absolute maximum of its potential, something which was unsafe to even attempt on the uncompromising and more powerful Kawasaki triples. 
Its twin cylinder engine was set well forward in the frame to reduce the chances of unexpected wheelies. But the first model Titan handled poorly, something which Suzuki immediately addressed by increasing the wheelbase. This change improved its handling and stability, and to my eye, gave the Titan an even more appealing look. It was a practical, fun, and a very good looking bike. What's your favourite? Cheers.